It was a last minute song written at record speed. After today's iconic rock band finished their ninth studio album, they realized they still had three minutes and 57 seconds of space left on the record. I mean, no big deal, right? Well, this band, they wanted to give their fans the most bang for their buck. So they decided to squeeze just one more song onto this record. Only this band didn't write a lot of songs under four minutes. So they gave themselves the ultimate challenge, two days to see if they could write a song under four minutes. They dubbed it Project 357. Well, the song they cranked out, it became their highest charting track of all time. Unbelievable. I mean, these guys practically pulled that out of thin air. Just an afterthought and it rocketed up the charts. Find out how they beat the clock in the 80s and they improvised their way to their biggest hit, their only top 40 hit, and they're a legendary band, coming up on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember begging your parents for the latest sugary cereal based on the latest cool movie or TV show or cartoon, you're gonna dig this channel of pure musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe right now. You always get our best interviews and stories when you click on the bell. Uh, also check out our Patreon. We're putting up full interviews there, other content. You can become an honorary producer. Help us curate this music history and also check out our merch. It helps us keep the music alive. So it's time for another edition of one of my favorite shows on here, number one in our hearts. The show honors songs that were so unbelievably great, they should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, no doubt. But for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. So we changed history a little bit here. Today, we're returning to one of my favorite bands ever. A band who never really got their due on the charts, on the mainstream charts. But then again, dominating the charts, it was never part of their game plan. I'm talking about Canadian progressive trifecta. Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart. That's right, baby. Today, we're all about Rush. And their classic song, New World Man, from 1982's album Signals. So for the uninitiated, Rush originally formed in 68 in Toronto, Canada. I mean, we've gotten into their origins in an episode in the past. I think it was on Fly By Night. We won't get into detail on that here, but for almost the entirety of their decades long career, you could pencil and peer it on the drum kit, Lifeson on guitar and Getty Lee on vocals, bass, and uh, very relevant to today's episode, keyboards as well. So let's fast forward to the early 80s. Zero in on Rush in the era of new wave and synthesizers. You know, depending on when you discovered Rush, that will likely inform your opinion about when they went mainstream, if you will. I use that word loosely. However, I think you can make a strong case that between 1980 and 1984, Rush took their biggest step into the realm of so-called normal musical culture. Whether you're talking about album sales, chart positioning, or just you know, general visibility. This was definitely an era of big change for this band. Their first album of the new decade was, of course, Permanent Waves. It was released on January 14th, 1980. Uh, the band dropped two singles from this one. Spirit of Radio was the highest charter, hitting number 51 on the Billboard Hot 100. Permanent Waves would certify platinum in the US and it reached number four on the Billboard 200 album chart. Very big for the band. Then of course came 1981's Moving Pictures, a massive landmark album if there ever was one. There just aren't enough accolades for this one. Uh, to be fair, Rush is a landmark band though, and really how can you pick a favorite? It's like picking a favorite child. Uh, all the records are just great. But that being said, Moving Pictures is considered by many to be one of the greatest prog rock, hard rock offerings of all time. It's flawless, it's perfect, it just is. In it, the trio sharpened their new wave meets hard rock approach from 1980s permanent waves. It's a masterstroke from top to bottom. But for the sake of time, I'll just give a shout out to the singles. Uh, they were Limelight, uh, Vital Signs, and that one Rush song even non-Rush fans know by heart, Tom Sawyer. Moving Pictures scored a number three ranking on the Billboard 200, and it would go on to sell uh, 5 million copies plus in the US. 
After the success of Moving Pictures, Rush released their second live album, Exit Stage Left. Uh, then they got to work on their 1982 offering, Signals. Uh, in describing the band's evolution up to this point, Getty Lee said, I think you could say that the first period marked a band developing as players. And as time moved on and we got more proficient as players, that came to surface in a very obvious way on albums like Hemispheres, where the records are very overtly complex. And then we got into this period with keyboards where we started thinking more in terms of making records and producing records. So really, Signals, Power Windows, and Hold Your Fire have marked a shift from being players to producers. End of quote. So if moving pictures you know, highlighted the significance of synthesizers in Russia's ever-evolving sound, Signals definitely took it uh, keyboards to the next level. Uh, it's the first Rush album which had Alex's superb guitar work sinking deeper into the mix. Every track, except for New World Man, has copious amounts of keyboards. Three of the eight songs on the record were primarily written on keyboards. Chemistry, uh, The Weapon, and Subdivisions. <laughs> Getty has said that the first time he wrote an important part of his song with keyboards was for Tom Sawyer. But in terms of writing an entire song on keys, the first one was Subdivisions. A song that would really set the tone for this record. Their idea was to integrate more of the electric side of music into their sound. You know, giving it more melody, more texture, and really more heightened emotion. This was all in the spirit of exploration and in pursuit of sonic excellence. You couldn't expect anything more from them. Looking back now, it seems like a pivotal moment in the band's history. But for Getty Lee, the change was almost imperceptible at the time. It was just something new and fun to do. It was all very organic with how the band was evolving. However, this new direction, it would have some implications for Alex's role in the band, like I said. Left him very frustrated at times. It wasn't an easy task having to compete with the density of the keyboards, especially when you start layering them, as he would say. He would also say, they occupy the same frequencies. They're quite thick, and as a result of that, I went for a cleaner sound trying to work around it. He also would say, certainly on signals, there was a conflict. I think between the guitar and the keyboards we were using. For me, that's always been a bit of a sore spot, that record. Because I think there's good material on there, but I think the production on it is lacking. To me, that record doesn't sound that great from a guitar point of view. We were just starting to really get into keyboards, and I don't think we were very well balanced. End of quote. But, you know, despite the uneasy give and take between guitar and keyboards, Alex did admit that there were a lot of things that he liked about this direction. At the very least, it was very modern, very exciting. As for Neil, he felt like the addition of keyboards made the task of songwriting uh, more arduous, an even longer process. But he also said, we needed to expand our sound palette or get another member. And by then we already had such good chemistry among the three of us that it didn't feel right to add someone else. So it became a DIY situation with all of us trying to expand that palette. I mean, you couldn't put a fourth member into Rush. It just wouldn't have worked. Well, if you've listened to the album, I mean, you know they figured it out. Now, as we continue to break down this story, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I always wear. Zenny rocks. They do. They have incredible variety. You can choose from scores of pairs of glasses, from prescription to progressives to transition lenses, you know, those that go light to dark when you go outside, all for a price that is unbelievable, starting at just $6.95. Yeah, under seven bucks. You can get a pair of glasses or two for less than the price of a vinyl record. Check it out right up here at the info button or below. So Signals landed in stores on September 9th, 1982, and it went platinum in two months. It boasted eight stellar tracks, most of which would actually hit the airways. Singles from the record included uh, the flagship track, Subdivisions, Countdown, and of course today's featured song, New World Man. You 
can hear two other tracks on the radio as well, The Analog Kid and The Weapon. Uh, the former went to number 19 on the U.S. Mainstream Rock Charts. So as far as New World Man goes, you could say it was kind of a beat-the-clock experiment, right? As Getty and Neil would both recount, New World Man was the last song that was written for Signals. It was actually a continuation of a tradition that the band had had in place for years, according to the guys. Whenever they reached the end of the recording process, they always felt like they could fit you know, just one more song on the album. What Getty would say about it started way back with 2112. It was Twilight Zone. We threw on uh, at the last minute. We wrote it in the studio. We recorded it all in a matter of two days. That became a tradition for us that we kind of looked forward to. What's going to be the last minute song on the record? Because so much of our stuff is rehearsed, you know, planned out. It was nice to have something on each record that was off the cuff. Vital Signs was like that too, end of quote. You have entered the twilight. So this time around, they weren't sure there was going to be enough room on the record to fit another song. At least not long enough to meet their usual standards as a band. It was going to be pretty close. Uh, the basic tracks for Signal's seven other songs, they were already finished. And really, they could have called it quits at that point. But as Puritt would say, we have always wanted to write another song. We want more. According to the drummer, the band felt like they had a moral responsibility to keep their albums from being too short. They wanted to give their fans as much bang for their buck as possible. This was back in the 80s when records cost money. Even if that meant they only had an extra three minutes and 57 seconds to work with, and that is exactly how much space was left on this. Now, in order to keep the two sides of the record equal in length and you know, to avoid mastering problems, they had to come up with something under four minutes. And just for reference, the rest of the album's tracks averaged over five and a half minutes. Classic Rush. So Rush did take on this challenge. If the song was too long, it just wouldn't go on the record. But if they could write something short enough, then their listeners would have one more track and a full record. They dubbed the proceedings Project 357. Now to get things rolling, uh, Neil spent some time going through his notebooks, looking for lyrical inspirations. What he ended up doing was tying together a few themes from some of the band's other songs. Uh, the combination yielded a straightforward, succinct set of lyrics made up of two verses and two choruses. From there, the guys, they got to work. To the the so the trio agreed to play the track fast and loose. You know, they wrote it in one day and they recorded it the very next. You know, what they said is they wanted to capture a spontaneous, relaxed sort of feel for this song. Just to keep it raw and live. That would make it a nice contrast to the rest of the album. Now, ultimately, Rush rose to the challenge and they finished the track in near record time. They beat the clock as New World Man came in at 3 minutes and 42 seconds. Now, Peart said that writing and recording the song in just two days was almost as fast as they'd ever gone. He actually claimed their record was writing and recording Twilight Zone in just one day. Now, earlier I quoted Getty exactly. He said they wrote Twilight Zone in two days, so there's a slight discrepancy there. But either way, it's just crazy how talented this band is and, you know, how quickly they could write a record on demand. To catch the heat of the you know, but actually their producer, Terry Brown, he wasn't all that crazy about the track at least not at first. With its reggae vibe, he thought it sounded a little bit too much like the police. He said, and I quote, deep down inside my thoughts were, why are we doing this? The police are doing this themselves. Why are we doing it? Now, admittedly, he wasn't a reggae fan. That did affect the way he heard the song. Eventually, he came around. He said that it was unique enough and that it had some interesting parts. Additionally, he said the lyrics had, you know, some substance. <laughs> Speaking of the lyrics, let's talk about that. As usual, Neil Peart was on point with his work, and I'd say that they had more than just some substance. This is actually really deep stuff. I'm not sure what other Rush tracks he drew from, but Getty actually connected the song with Tom Sawyer and Circumstances. 
his thought was that the unifying idea in all three of these tracks was Neil's interest in change. Now, New World Man, it feels like there's an intense conflict taking place here, you know, a tug of war between generations. Or at least that's one way that I look at it when I hear it. Obviously, you can draw your own conclusions. From this perspective, the song's old world man, I feel like that represents the previous generation, you know, our parents, their perspectives, their contributions to the world. Trying to save the day for the old world man. The new world man, the current generation, uh, the one that wants to change how things are done and to fix the problems from the past, or as Peart puts it, he's saving the day for the old world man. And then there's the third world man, which actually has double meanings there. But in this context, it represents the third generation, one that's still in the future. And Neil says the new world man is paving the way for the third world man. So there's the conflict between the past, present, and future. I think like every new generation, they like to think that they're improving on what came before, and every older generation feels like the world's just getting worse. I feel like New World Man, it perfectly articulates this struggle. After all, the New World Man is wise enough to win the world, but fool enough to lose it. I don't know, how do you interpret the track? I love Neil Peart's lyrics. He always gives you some really heavy ideas to wrestle with, thought-provoking. So obviously Rush and all their prog rock glory weren't very concerned about singles and chart positions. I mean, especially in the 70s. But like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the early 80s it was a time of a big change for this band. I don't want to say that they ever focused on singles because I don't think they did. But if you look at their track record starting in the 80s, they did put together a consistent list of top 40 hits on the U.S. mainstream rock charts, which is, of course, the best way to measure it for a rock band, including promotional and live singles. Rush kicked out 20 top 10 hits between 81 and 2010, five that went to number one, the first of which was New World Man. Plus, they had another 20 top 40 hits as well. So 40 mainstream rock top hits, uh, those are crazy numbers. In fact, I could only find one charting single on the mainstream rock chart that didn't break into the top 40. Anybody want to take a guess what that was? It was Tom Sawyer, Rush's most universally well-known song. It just missed out at number 42. <laughs> Go figure. For not being a singles band, Rush absolutely dominated the rock charts. Now, looking at the Billboard Hot 100, the main chart, pop chart, it's a different story. I mean, New World Man, it's actually their all-time highest charting single. It came in at number 21. It's also their only, only top 40 hit. The next closest singles uh, were Tom Sawyer at 44. Yeah, that wasn't a top 40 hit. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and the big money went to number 45. As I'm sure you can guess, New World Man also did well in Russia's home country, Canada. It reached number one and stayed there for two weeks in October of 82. So let's get back to number one in our hearts. Let's rewrite some history. Even though Rush wasn't a singles band per se, as monumental as they were in a perfect world, they should have topped the charts at least a couple times. So let's do it. Going back to the week that New World Man peaked at number 21, the top five songs were Number five, Up Where We Belong by Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warrens. Number four, I Keep Forgetting Every Time You're Near, parenthesis song by the great Michael McDonald. Number three, Eye in the Sky by the Alan Parsons Project. Number two, Jack and Diane by John Mellencamp as he likes to be called. Little ditty about Jack and Diane. And at number one, Who Can It Be Now by Men at Work. I mean, that's pretty stiff competition. Really good songs there. But you know, since Who Can It Be Now only got one week at number one, I'm gonna fast forward just one week 
Here, Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warrens took the top spot with Up Where We Belong, uh, the first of three straight weeks, as a matter of fact. I'm thinking we could have the officer and a gentleman duo step aside for just one week so that we can give Rush their due. It's the right thing to do. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Rush and New World Man. What are your memories of the song? What do you think about the band? What do you think of their best singles? Um, and, and another one, what do you think about the first three albums of the 80s? I think they're just masterpieces. Let's have a great discussion about Rush, the greatest trio in history, in my opinion. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below and uh, make sure uh, to help us keep the music alive. That's what we do here. It's about the interviews, the memories, the good stuff. Till next time, three chords.